the third at break of dawn yeah the son of hell and rose again hey oh trample death Jesus, meet us in this moment and speak through your word that we are closer to you, Jesus, when this moment is over than we were when it first began. Get your glory in this place. Thank you for this moment, this conference, this local church that has global influence. And for all of the nations that are gathered in this room and those who are connected or watching or who will watch. And to the name of the one who still has all power, Yeshua HaMashiach, the prophesied Messiah, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, the propitiation for our sins, the price has been paid, the tomb is empty. So we are not gonna be quiet tonight. Yeah. Tell the angels to scoot over, God, because we're getting ready to make a sound that shakes the heavens and makes devils move out of the way. We're going to open up the capacity of our lungs, and we might stomp a little bit, and we might clap a little bit, and we might shout a little bit, and we might dance a little bit, and we might give you glory a little bit. In the name of Jesus, we pray amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord 10 seconds of great praise, the best praise that you can. You can be seated. It is an honor to be here with you in this moment. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for pastors Brian and Bobby. I'm thankful for their vision. I'm thankful for their leadership, their commitment to championing the cause of the local church and for all that Hillsong has meant uh, to the body of Christ globally and to 
my wife and myself personally. Thank you, Pastor, uh, for your yes. Thank you for what you mean. Thank you that uh, you have allowed God to use you to bring the body of Christ together in a very divided time. Thank you, sir. Thank you to your team. And thank God for all those who are gathered here. Shout out to Pastor Chris Hodges, who is one of the greatest teachers, pastors, and leaders in the body of Christ. I don't know where he is, but what he has been able to do in building the church and developing leaders is nothing short of supernatural and revolutionary. And I thank God for you, sir. You are a man of great integrity and tremendous anointing. I'm honored to call you friend. To um, Carl Lee Lentz, who was amazing this afternoon in our leadership session and is one of the seminal voices of our generation, thank you for being a friend and a brother in my life. I want to give honor to you and your beautiful bride. Thank you for inviting me here 10 years ago, telling me that if I got here, you'd give me a place to stay. And I got here and there was no room. And so I thank you <laughs> for bringing a black man halfway around the world and then tell me to go swimming in shark infested waters when I'm already built like a seal and sharks like dark meat. So thank you tried to kill me. <laughs> I love you and I thank God for you. To uh, Pastor Judah Smith, whose message last night was <laughs> nothing short of life-changing. Thank you, Pastor Judah, to your wife, Chelsea, for your consistent anointing and the power that you walk in. I'm very grateful for you uh, and for who you are in the body of Christ and then what can I say about Pastor Stephen Furtick? God has used him to change the way the world sees the church. I'm grateful for not only your unmatched preaching skill, but your ridiculous songwriting skills that are changing the way people engage God in worship. I love you, sir. Grateful for you and your wife and your team. And uh, thank you for talking about pull-ups, because it's clear I can only wear a pull-up. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you and the rest of the muscular saints, whatever. Okay, the Lord has enlarged my territory. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. But you can't do that, so. How about that, Steve-O? <laughs> That hurt. <laughs> Gotta preach. Gotta preach. Gotta preach. But before I do, I gotta take a moment to honor the woman who said yes to me close to eight years ago, who has given me two children and gave them to me in 11 months. <laughs> bang, bang. <laughs> Your love has changed me. God used you to be an agent of healing in my life. And I'm not standing in front of the world if you haven't covered me when I was by myself. I'm very grateful for everything that you've done that no one has seen and may never know about. But thank you for fighting for me when I couldn't fight for myself. And thank you for expanding and blessing every area of my life. I don't deserve you, but I'm glad I got you. And I'm going to honor you for as long as God gives me breath. Thank you, Aventer Gray, and I love you. <laughs> Hurry up with this sermon. Go back to the hotel. Um, Genesis... <laughs> Genesis chapter 32. Oh! 
Starting at the 22nd verse, I'm reading from the New King James Version. I'm gonna come out there, because I'm already sick of it. Um, I hope my long introduction wasn't like a part of, of my time preaching, because you don't give a black preacher 30 minutes. That's like giving a whale a Tic Tac. It doesn't work. <laughs> Genesis 32, starting at the 22nd verse. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford Yabok. And he took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man capital M, wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of that place Penai or Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, this, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. And I want to preach from the subject, shrinking for expansion. Shrinking for expansion. So the, the theme of the conference is there is more. More. When you're this size, more is a blessed word. More. Super size. Just like a regular, I don't want a regular nothing. I don't want anything regular. I don't want a regular drink. I don't want regular fries. I want, where, where's more super size? When something tastes good, I don't want just a little bit. I want more. What's your favorite candy? What do they eat over here? Tim Tams? What, what? Can you eat one Tim Tam? You have to have. Now, you don't need more Vegemite. I don't know what y'all are doing. It looks like chocolate, y'all lied to me. It, it, that's not, it's terrible. It's like roasted sardines and a garlic sauce. What in the world? We've been screaming, there is more. But how does God get more to you? I'm sure when this conference started, it wasn't in this arena. But because word spread, expectation spread, hunger for, from the people who needed more of God. There wasn't enough room in previous locations, and so you had to get bigger venues to meet the demand. And so capacity had to be expanded because they needed more room. There's not enough hill songs. There's Great to have a Hills campus and, and one downtown or in city center and one in Brisbane and one over here and a couple over there and there's one in Perth, I believe. And then, you know, like Stockholm and Denmark and, 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 and you know, Hillsong Paris and, and Hillsong New York and L.A. and, you know, Hillsong whatever. And why? Because one was not enough. The earth needed more. 
But Hillsong is but one part of God's great plan that was uh, established in Matthew 16 when Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. He didn't say, I'll build churches. There's only one church, just different branches. And so while we rightfully gather and celebrate and marvel at what one local church has done, you cannot minimize the impact of what God wants to do in your life because you have a calling that is as essential as the calling of Hillsong. People may not know your name, they may not yet sing your songs, but it does not minimize that the same Holy Ghost that is on Hillsong is in you. And you have to be willing to be available to do the work of ministry as God has called you. And you must do that without looking to the side and shrinking back because you see how big someone else's thing is because the enemy of the anointing is comparison. And so I don't have to worry about how many members are in your youth group and how many people come to your weekend services you need to be focused on obeying the voice of God because obedience brings the audience. And all of us should be hungering to do the thing we were created to do. Yeah, there is more, but how does God get more to us? You can't embrace more unless somebody has less. More, more what? More influence, more authority, more, more, more notoriety, more popular, more what? God, there is more what? Well, let's talk about this guy named Jacob. Jacob is a case study in someone who was not content with who he was or where he was. Even before the man was, the boy was born, there was a prophecy to his mom, two nations are in your womb, and, and the older shall serve the younger. First baby came out hairy, red. <laughs> and as his heel was coming out, the second baby stuck his arm out, grabbed the heel. You ain't going nowhere without me. <laughs> and he got his name based on his first observable action. Heel grabber. Jacob translates heel grabber, supplanter. You're not going anywhere without me. And thus began a rivalry that lasted all the way up and through Genesis 32. Jacob always looking over his shoulder, wanting more than what he had. He was always the baby brother. And the worst thing you could be in a Middle Eastern patriarchal society was second. Nobody ever says, if you ever see sports on TV, nobody puts a, hey, we're number two. <laughs> nobody wants to be second. Esau was the firstborn. I get the birthright. I get the double portion. I get the blessing. Not only was he the firstborn, his father liked him. Didn't just love him, he liked him like Esau, that's my dude. And the Bible says that Esau was a man of the, of the woods. He was a hunter. He was out there in the streets. He was doing manly things. And the Bible says Jacob was a homebody, just in the house. Mama, you want some more food? He was cooking. He was chilling at the house. So he didn't have the same level of relational connection to his father. And it's weird because they came from the same mother, had the same father, and they had different relationships. And, and Jacob longed for that level of closeness, that, that level of affirmation that came from a father saying, I'm proud of you. But he never got it. And he always looked at Esau with the side eye, secretly desiring to have what he thought Esau had, what he thought Esau had. And then one day, Esau comes home after hunting, and he's exhausted. And he's like, hey, Jacob, you be cooking all the time. Why don't you make me some of that stew? Jacob was like, sell me your birthright. Esau was like, birthright? I don't care about a birthright. I'm about to die. I'm, so, I'm hungry. Just make me some stew. He's like, no, promise you'll sell me your birthright. And Esau sold his inheritance for a bowl of stew. 
And how many people make permanent decisions based off a of temporary hunger? If Esau had any honor and integrity in him, he would have realized there is more to my life than this temporary hunger. I can't, I would never sell what I couldn't purchase. It was conferred upon him. And I want to speak to every individual here and those watching that there is something in you so uniquely valuable, so intrinsically powerful about you that you could not duplicate it again under any circumstance. You are a unique, one-of-a-kind masterwork of the living God, and there will never be another you in the history of the world. And so stop cowering down and shrinking back and being afraid and minimizing who you are because perhaps your gift looks different or the expression of your anointing looks different than someone else in the place of false humility. Well, God, if, if you want to use me, if you can do anything, use me. He wants to use you. He wants to give you more. He wants to give you a platform so that you can let the world know who it is who saved you, who it is who's changed you, who it is who has turned your life around. It's more than a conference. God wants you to leave here and walk in some authority and walk in some power and let the whole world know that Jesus is not just for the safe construct of a big arena, but he has authority in every area of government, finance, institutional, academia, entertainment, sports, psychology, philosophy. Wherever people are, that's where God needs to be. Can I get a five-second praise break? Shrinking for expansion with the idea that there is more. It's not sin to believe God for more. It's not pride to believe God for more. It is biblical to believe God for more. And when we encounter this guy named Jacob in Genesis 32, he had accumulated so much because after he purchased the birthright from his brother, and then got the blessing from his father, and Esau realized what had happened, the Bible says that Jacob's mother said, get your stuff, you gotta get out. Your brother comforts himself with the thought of killing you. You gotta get out of here. And so thus began years of running. Running. Running because he didn't feel worthy running because he was afraid of the consequences, running because of everything around him. He was constantly looking over his shoulders. He has a blessing, but he has no peace. He has a blessing, but he has no joy. He has a blessing, but he's got constant fear because he doesn't know when Esau is coming. And there are so many people who on one hand believe that God has a plan for your life, but because of something you've done in your past or something you struggle with in your present, you believe that your position with God is tenuous the anointing on you can be taken away or somehow God is going to change his mind about you. But this is what you need to know. The Bible says, all my days were written when as yet there were none of them. How precious are your thoughts towards me, O oh God. If I were to count them, they would number more than the grains of sand. God wrote your life backwards so you could walk it out forwards. He who knows the end from the beginning, which means if God started at the end, then there is nothing that you or I have ever done that will catch him off guard. I'm about to preach in about four American minutes. Let me, let me help you to catch this. There is nothing that has caught God by surprise. He has never looked at your life and like, hey, I did not see that coming. Hey, Holy Ghost, did you see that? No, man, I didn't know he was going to do that. I didn't know he was going to do that. There is no issue, no sin, no habit, no proclivity, no failure that was not already acutely 
clear to God and that's why he factored in your humanity when he called you. So stop disqualifying yourself because of your humanity. Stop trying to talk God out of your calling when he knew who you were when he called you. I'm going to preach it like I feel it. Jacob had been on the run he had been running for a long time. But by Genesis 32, he was tired of running. He had a lot of stuff, a lot of animals, a lot of possessions. He had 11 sons. He had two wives. But he never had peace. And so Esau was coming for him. He knew Esau was right up behind him. And it's funny because a lot of people say, I really can't identify. But let, let me... Let me make it more practical because, you know, I keep looking behind me because I'm, I'm wondering if he's coming. And you're saying who? And I don't know, but everywhere I go, this dude shows up. Every time I preach, I'm not lying. I don't care where I'm at. This guy shows up. He's black. He's big. Skinny legs, big stomach. He can do a couple pull-ups, Stephen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with a stair step. Um, <laughs> it's strange. He looks like me, but he doesn't like me. He actually, and, and here's what's crazy. I checked into my hotel, and he was in my room. I went into the bathroom, and I looked in the mirror, and there he was. Because everywhere I go, I see him. I see the worst things I've ever done, my biggest failures, all of my insecurities, all of my fears. And I have to juxtapose them against the calling on my life. And how could God use this broken man to speak to all of these thousands of people and millions around the world when I know who I am when no one is looking? And I'm wondering if anybody else is going to see this man over my shoulder. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I know that you're perfect, but every time I see me, I see two of me. The man I was and the man I desire to be. And they're all caught inside of the man that I am. And everywhere I go, he's right there. And over the last two years, I've traveled half a million miles. Man, the airlines love me. And people will say, wow, you're blessed. Man, you got, a, you got it going on. You're, you're in demand. People love to hear you speak, man. You can sing, man. You do comedy, you funny. Yeah, all that's great. <laughs> Your gift don't make room for you. The problem is gifts don't mature. Character does. And as long as you produce, people don't ask the real questions like, are you hurting? How's your marriage? Got any secret addictions? You struggling? Nobody asks because they want you to produce. And it's so scary because I've seen people who are gifted and who are talented and in front of folk, they have everything that looks like success, but on the inside, they're afraid of their own shadow. Jacob had it all and had nothing because he didn't believe he deserved it in the first place. Jacob, Jacob, John, I mean, Jacob. Jacob, John Gray, I mean, excuse me, Jacob, focus, Jacob, he, he had it all. He had the accumulated things. He had Instagram followers. I mean, John, no, I mean, Jacob, he, he had notoriety. He had good friends, but he struggled because he was still searching for the validation of a father that was never there for him. And he's still chasing after validation, hoping that somebody will see him. And Jacob, I mean, John, I'm getting confused because there was a place in Jacob's life that he wanted to be celebrated, but nobody understood him, and so he was simply tolerated. And then when he became what he was, he didn't know how to keep it, and he wasn't sure what to choose. And that's why he had two wives, because he was two men. Wow. 
Rachel is what he chose in immaturity. Leah is what he needed for his legacy. Sometimes when you're immature, you'll choose something that looks good but won't produce because the Bible says Rachel was barren, but Leah produced legacy after legacy and seed after seed. And even though he did not desire her in his, in his initial years, at the time of his death, he said, bury me with Leah. Because sometimes you got to grow into your legacy. Help me, Holy Ghost. Jacob was a man of duality. And here's the thing. I know that you've been saved and you know all 67 books of the Bible. 67 books, right? How many? No. Because the Bible says you are living letters. So you're book 67. So I may not read the word, but I'll read your life. Is your life a sermon that I could read and see Jesus? Jacob had been running his whole life. The Bible says he got to a place called Yabok. J-A-B-B-O-K, and it means emptying. And if you are ever going to be used by God to expand his kingdom, he always empties you first. Help me, Holy Ghost. Let me, let me help you. Shrinking for expansion. If God is going to expand you, there are five E's. I want you to write these down. Get them in your spirit. Before expansion, there is emptying. God has to empty you. He, 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 he. Sent everything he had, all of his possessions, his wives, his servants, his money, his donkeys, his houses, his land. He sent it over. And the Bible says he was left alone as he was. He was left alone. It is the most uncomfortable place in the world is to be left alone. He accumulated this stuff. He worked his whole life. He thought the stuff would satisfy him. And no matter what he had, he was still empty on the inside. I got the blessing. I got the wives. I got the kids. I got the stuff. And I'm still empty. Please stop running after the illusion of success. and Settle for the peace of God that's found in the purpose of God. Because the purpose of God is where the blessing of God is. It's not in the celebration of man. It's not in the validation from men. It is found simply in the pleasure of God, in the countenance of his glory, in the presence of a face-to-face -face encounter. But God in his love will let you run after everything else. And when you have acquired it and attained it and you still have echoes at night, echo, echo, and there's only an echo because there's enough space for nothing to catch the sound. And I know what it's like to be gifted and profoundly lonely. Preaching to thousands, waiting on somebody to speak to you. And God allowed Jacob to be our example that before God expands you, he has to empty you because everything you think defines you cannot satisfy you. There is a God-sized hole on the end side of every individual that only God could fill. And if you had every platform you ever wanted, it still wouldn't fill it. And if you had every crowd you ever wanted, it still wouldn't fill it. And if you met everybody you ever wanted, it still wouldn't fill it because it's not God. If he's going to expand you, he's got to empty you. Then the next thing is he's going to engage you. The Bible says when Jacob was left alone, and I know what that's like, traveling all the time, sitting in hotels, FaceTiming my wife and my kids. So strange. I found myself preaching to crowds. I was at a men's conference preaching my heart out. The anointing of God was there. But I was so afraid of going back home because I didn't know how to be a husband or a father. I didn't know how to raise my son because the last thing I wanted him to be was another version of me. 
And why am I talking about this? And y'all like, when is the joy? When are you going to shout? Aren't you funny? Aren't you funny? Can you make us laugh? Let me help you to understand the purpose of this message is not to entertain. It is to break the chain because God has to shrink you before he expands you. <laughs> Jacob was left alone. It's the last thing he wanted. He surrounded himself with stuff hoping it would drown out the silence. He was left alone, and the Bible says a man came and wrestled, but many theologians believe it was a pre-incarnate Jesus. And when you wrestle, you can't wrestle somebody that you don't engage, say engage. You can't wrestle someone without putting your hands on them. You can't, and they were wrestling at night. Why wouldn't you wrestle in the daytime? Why are they wrestling at night? You can't see anything. And that's why God has been coming to some of us in the middle of our darkest situations because he wants to engage you when you can't figure it out with your physical eyes because we walk by faith, not by sight. I'm trying to preach to somebody. So they engaged. If, if you're going to be used by God to expand his kingdom, first he'll empty you, then he'll engage you. And they were, they were fighting in the desert, which means there was some dust that was kicked up, which is important because Jesus creates from the dust of the ground. And Jacob's issue was identity, and he needed a renewal of identity because the truth is he didn't like who he was. He was always escaping who he was. That's why he wanted his brother's blessing because he didn't think he was enough. And the shame of feeling like he stole the blessing is why he kept looking over his shoulder for Esau, but poor Jacob didn't know you can't steal a blessing because the blesser has to confer it, and nobody has ever stolen anything from God. If you got it, it's because God wanted you to have it. So stop apologizing for your anointing. Stop apologizing for your gifting. Stop apologizing for your platform. If God wanted somebody else on the platform, he would have had them on the platform. And I promise you, I find every devil that told me I didn't deserve to be standing here tonight. You know why I'm here tonight? Because God wanted me here tonight. Are there better speakers, better preachers, more qualified? Absolutely. And also absolutely not because God does not use human qualification. He uses his spirit and as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. I need a five second praise break. Jacob was 80s, 90 years old, wrestling in the desert, getting dusty. The dust didn't just get on him, Richie. The dust got in him. But I'm glad that he was wrestling with the angel of the Lord, the living God, Jesus, the creator. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Through him all things were made that were made, and not one thing that was made was made without him, which is why dust had to be kicked up in the wrestling because he was created from dust, and he was recreated in the dust. Stop running from the dusty areas of your life. Jesus is trying to recreate you. Stop, stop being afraid of the dust. He empties you, then he engages you while he recreates you. There's an emptying. There's an engaging. Then there was an encounter. Because there was a point when after wrestling, the angel just touched the socket of his hip. <laughs> Popped his hip out of joint. If you know anything about the hip, it's a ball and socket. It's a, it's a circle. It's a sphere. You know why? Because Jacob had been running in circles his whole life. And so the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Jesus, some theologians believe just touched him in his hip because your hip is the thing that causes you to pivot. It's the thing that causes you to run. And God says, it's time to stop running. Let me touch the thing that causes you to run. I've been running around this world over and over again, and I've met everybody that I could ever want to meet. I had met everyone except myself. People don't like uncomfortable moments 
So I'm going to rewind it because instead of talking about you, I'm going to use me as the example. Preaching to the whole world and still wasn't sure of who I was in Christ. It can happen to the best of us. And there was a moment when I had an encounter and I said, wait a minute. I'm not preaching for validation. I'm preaching from validation. If nobody celebrates me, I'm still anointed, not because of what I did, but because of who called me. And I didn't call me, and I didn't make me, and I didn't give me a platform. I'm not self-made, I'm God-made, which means I'm exactly who God wanted and who God intended for me to be. And I had not only an encounter, but once you have an emptying, an engagement, and when you have an encounter, you finally have an epiphany. Oh. I'm not wrestling a man. I'm in the presence of God. And when you get the epiphany, then you get the last E, the emancipation. Because for most of us, if we're going to be used by God to expand his kingdom, then we're going to have to get free. And whom the sun sets free is, I'm going to need somebody over here because y'all are quiet. I said whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And so I've got to be emptied. I've got to engage God. I have to encounter God. Then I get the epiphany of God. Then I get the emancipation or the freedom of God. He shrunk his hip. They playing the slow music. That means my time is up. <laughs> shrunk his hip. And he said, I can't fight anymore. All I can do is hold on. He said, let me go to daybreak. He said, nah. If you were just a man, I would have let go. But something tells me you're more than a man. So I'm not letting you go till you bless me. He said, what's your name? Said, Jacob. The thing he had been running from his whole life, he just blurted it out. I'm, I'm exactly who you think I am. And the angel said, nah. You'll no longer be called Jacob. I like that. He didn't say your name is not Jacob. He just said, you have been all of that stuff, but now you're a prince because you engaged God. You faced the uncomfortable thing. You've contended with God and with man and have prevailed. He held on long enough. He said, I can't run anymore. My brother is probably going to kill me but I need you to bless me. And it was in this moment that Jacob didn't just get a name change. It wasn't just a, a conferring of different letters. It was a, a new identity. He, who he was was unlocked, expanded. Jacob couldn't be the leader and, 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 and the, the progenitor of, of, the, of the nation that God would redeem through his son. But Israel, yeah, yeah, Israel. But you don't get to that unless you wrestle as Jacob. And I want to speak to every person in here. Engage God where you are. Fight in the brokenness of who you think you are so that God can engage you and give you the identity that you've been searching for and stop looking for external validation that can only come from God. Don't chase platforms, chase his presence. Jacob was tired of running. He was tired of feeling unworthy, so he wrestled. And God will allow unworthy to sit in you until you're so tired of it that you'll fight until it's gone. Shame is a lie of the devil. You are worthy of everything that God is bringing into your life. Every place of position, every opportunity, every open door. Yes, there is more. But he has to change you. Even as Jesus was changed in Matthew 17, transfigured at the top of a mountain. Were all 12 disciples there? No. Peter, James, and John. 
What's funny is it was those same three that were with Jesus nine chapters later in Matthew 26 when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane at his lowest point. The people who see you at your highest can see you at your lowest because those who can see you transfigured can also see you transparent. God is wanting to speak to you. This is not just some gathering place for us to hang out with friends. It is a call to the greatest version of yourself. You think this imagery behind me is by chance? They're screaming, there is more with, with, the, with a rocket, with boosters coming, breaking through the clouds. Does anybody ever see a reverse on a rocket or rear view mirrors because rockets don't have reverse and they don't have rear view mirrors. So stop looking back, stop looking in your past, stop looking at what you did, stop looking at who you used to be, stop bringing up to God what is already under the blood and stop surrounding yourself with people who wanna remind you of the worst version of yourself. You are more than your mistakes, more than your past, more than your failure. So go ahead and get empty engage, encounter, get an epiphany, and then get emancipated. Get free for the son just wants to free you. Take it from me. Your gifts can only take you so far. Take it from me. Your talent can only cover you for so long. At some point, you're going to have to face Jesus. And whatever you are, when that encounter is over, will be enough for the calling on your life. I'm so glad that I'm now free from the need to be validated by people. It took a long time, but it's tiring running around the world hoping somebody likes you. And I hope that when you leave here in the next few minutes, you never again wonder if you're enough because you are enough right in that seat up at the top or here at the front who you are is enough and there is no devil in hell that can take your anointing there is no past mistake that can disqualify you there is nothing that you could ever do that would make God change his mind that's why you should sing with joy sing with boldness sing with authority and praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing God's praise Oh Lord, oh Lord our God, somebody stand up and give him a great praise. we blessed at Hillsong Conference. That was amazing. Thanks so much, Pastor John Gray, for that. It was incredible. You guys having a great week? You having a great week? Fantastic. 
you know what we're going to do tonight? We're just going to keep worshiping. We're going to keep worshiping. I really hope you guys keep leaning in. We're going to believe for the Holy Spirit to do something powerful. Amen. As young and free, keep leading us in praise and in worship. Amen. Come on, give them a big hand.